afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the afternoon session of um, the Law Lit Fest, where we'll be spending the next hour ambling from Morocco to Darjeeling. Um, the topic is food, tea, and wanderlust. And I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Momina Ejazuddin. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here with Jeff Kohler, who's a writer, traveler, and cook, uh, which are all of my passions as well. So I'm very excited to be in conversation with him today. He's the author of several books and articles on food and culture, including Spain, um, a book that came out on recipes and traditions that was published in 2013 and was one of the best-selling, actually, cookbooks for the New York Times, uh, several, uh, several uh, publications that year. Uh, is named one of the you know 2013's top uh, cookbooks um, and he then followed that up uh, with Morocco a culinary journey with recipes and uh, la paella deliciously authentic rice dishes from Spain's Mediterranean coast so his work has appeared in several food related magazines Savo, Food Wine, The Washington Post, uh, LA Times, Afar, Tin House, Best Food Writing and on NPR so, and including in Newsweek, uh, the session, um, the, the program uh, which has come out especially for the LLF, so I'd encourage you to read it. Um, so we'll start actually, uh, you know, just a conversation really. Uh, Jeff, if you, this is not your first trip to Lahore, which is actually great. You've been once and returned. That's right. Um, I'm happy to be back. It's been a while. I was here about 25 years ago, actually. I spent a couple of months in Pakistan. And uh, landed in Karachi uh, early one morning, and um, I travel quite a bit in Lahore, obviously stands out as one of my kind of hi travel highlights, but I, I was able to go to Peshawar and up the coast, I mean up the frontier with Afghanistan, up into the mountains and cross into Kashgar and back, so I was also able to see the amazing mm -hmm. So, But that was your first trip to the subcontinent, which year was that? Maybe 1993. <laughs> yeah, 1993. And it was summer that when I was here, it was June, and it was like 47 degrees, and it was extremely hot. I, I was staying at the Salvation Army, and I don't know if they still have like a youth hostel there. It was the cheapest place to stay uh, in town, and it, you know, there was, I had a bed outside, which is even cheaper than inside, but there was no, of course, no air conditioning, but the fans, the electricity would go off for many hours at night, and so there was no, not even fans. Um, so the, the, my first experience in Lahore was, was definitely um, appreciating severe heat. I, I never felt 47 degree temperature before. So, yeah. <laughs> so when, when they told me it's going to be, this is the best time of year in February, you have to come back in February. Great, as long as it's not June maybe. But. <laughs> so the, I mean, what were your uh, earliest memories actually of travel? Uh, how did you even get into this? Uh, how did that influence well, you? I grew up north of Seattle in a really kind of blandish rural suburbia. Um, we had chickens and a couple of cows and um, it was kind of this comfortable area and but my grandparents retired really early. My grandfather wanted to travel. That's all he wanted to do. So when he had enough money, um, he sold the house and they moved everything to an apartment and at 42 maybe or 43 they started to travel. And they spent about 10 years a month on the road and so when I was growing up, they would uh, reappear every couple of months and they'd have these amazing slideshows. And so when, when my very first memory is looking at slides at Africa, um, but my childhood was National Geographic and their slideshows. And it was one of those big events because you didn't just have a photo album, it was a slideshow. And my, my grandfather would kind of narrate, my grandmother would sit in the back with her journal kind of adding details and numbers and dates. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of began it. And then, um, so I was kind of wanted to travel, but it really wasn't after university um, when I started to travel kind of extensively. I really wanted to go from London to Cape Town uh, in a year. And I didn't make Cape Town. Um, and it, one year became four, actually. Kind of, uh, I worked a bit in Alaska as a, as a, as a tour guide, driving a tour bus. Um, used to talking to these microphones you know, all, all day long driving across that. The Alaskan tundra, you had nothing to talk about for 10 hours, so you just kind of make up stories. And, um, so that's when I passed through you know, the, the subcontinent was kind of those travels. I just kind of started it, it just kind of continued. Mm. And so what was the role of food in this travel? I mean, Well, I mean, for four years, I, I ate in restaurants, I ate on the street, I didn't cook. And even when I stopped traveling, I went to graduate school in London. Um, 
began cooking, and it was really five years and when I moved to Spain when I didn't have a kitchen. So for five years, I was, ex I was exploring and tasting you know, flavors that I had no idea even existed. I mean, again, I, the first time I ever had you know, food from the subcontinent was in Alaska one time. There was a one Indian restaurant in Anchorage when I was living there. They had a buffet on Sundays. Sometimes we'd go, and you had no idea what anything was. I mean, I never had Indian food before. I mean, it was really... It's, you know, it was really my, we ate a lot of meat growing up and, you know, we had cows. I mean, we used to eat our own cows. I mean, this, this was dinner. I mean, we never ate in restaurants almost. <laughs> so it was a big shock and we kind of started kind of discovering, um, especially in East Africa, I, I met up people who have come this direction from Asia and they kept talking about this amazing food, mm -hmm. you know, in, in this part of the world and we'd be stuck in Kenya and, you know, Uganda and it's just really bland, mm -hmm. um, interesting food. And it was going on and on and on about, you know, the great food here and so finally when I um, kind of reached here, I, I didn't know anything but you know, a, a couple of dishes that I kept hearing about. And when I got to India finally, mutta paneer was the only thing I remembered. So, paneer. so for a week, it's the only, you go to that restaurant, I did, the only thing I ordered for an entire week because the only thing I could knew, I didn't know anything else. So it was, but it, this is the beginning, I didn't know anything so I was starting from scratch basically. So th this was my education and taste. Now you taste everything but when I was growing up, I mean it was really, you know, very Protestant, you know, Norwegian-ish kind of area where I live. It's very, so the, this was the school, I guess you call it, mm -hmm. beginning to learn to taste. Mm. So uh, in Lahore, we pride ourselves as being the food capital of Pakistan. Yeah. So I wanted to test your memory a little bit. Do you remember the meals that you had in Pakistan? I mean, it was your first exposure to I the I remember the yogurt and, uh, uh, and of course the tea, but I didn't have much money. So the, the flat bread, for me, the, 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 the fresh the breads and naans <laughs> and oh. And of course the tea. Um, last night, uh, able to uh, taste finally the brain masala, which was, um, I remember eating, for sure I had brain in Murray. I had spent a lot of time in Murray because it was really hot, so I remember lots of good memories of certain mm -hmm. foods in Murray. But here, the, the brain masala was pretty fantastic last night, I have to say, so. Um. Mm -hmm. And you traveled, actually, when you arrived in Pakistan, it was from Yemen. Right? I mean, yeah. you traveled from Karachi to Yemen. Yeah, I, I, I came across the Horn of Africa down through Sudan and um, Eritrea and Ethiopia and to Djibouti, and then I went to Yemen. And then uh, from Yemen, I came to mm -hmm. in, into Karachi. And the, for sure, my, my first food memory of Pakistan was that arriving, you know, at, uh, really late or really early and, and, and coming into the center of Karachi at, just as it was getting, you know, light. And, and the first thing you do, you know, is find a cup of tea and, and something to eat. Mm -hmm. I mean, th that's where your experience with the place begins. It mm -hmm. begins with the food. I mean, the first thing you do when you arrive is you eat, yeah. you know? No, and so that cup of tea and the paratha was my very first memory of, of, of Pakistan. Well, it's funny you say that because I had these friends in college, um, I mean, in England, who went to Delhi and bought Enfi an Enfield a motorbike, and then they drove back from Delhi through to England. But they survived on a diet of chai and parathas, you know, throughout their road trip through Pakistan. And that was the one thing that they remembered. So throughout college, they would make me dudh patti, uh, you know, milk and tea. And that was the one thing that remained with them, you know, from Pakistan. So well, I mean, traveling like that, when I had a certain amount of money that I earned in Alaska. When that ran out, I had to go home. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you spent as little as possible and you kind of justified anything else. And, you know, you're on the street a lot and, and it just, you know, and when you smell fresh bread coming out, it's impossible not to eat it. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, it, absolutely impossible. Yeah. So there, I was reading a book recently uh, by Alan de Bottom, which is about the art of travel. And that one dis discovers, you know, there is an art in traveling because you discover very new things about the place that you're going to. Um, and what, how do you approach travel? that way? Is it through food? Is it through uh, appreciation of the culture, the literature? How, how do you look at new places? I mean, now it's probably more, more through food, but, um, but that started a while ago. I mean, it, it, I found, you know, you, you go sit in some cafe, you know, you're, you're, you're in Karachi, and you, you arrive in, in, in a place, you kind of stare, but if you sit in a cafe for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. they kind of stop noticing you. And then you can start to kind of watch people a bit and observe mm -hmm. and maybe take a few notes, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're always writing in your journal. And then you can start to interact. Mm. And so often, even if the food wasn't, I approach it to the flavors of a place, th these are the safe places to go. I mean, th these are where you interact the easiest. Mm. One thing is being approached by somebody on the street who starts talking to you. Another thing is sitting at a, at a table in a crowded cafe, and after some time, you begin talking to the person next to you, and maybe you start playing backgammon or whatever. But th this is the interaction, and this is what I, I realize. I mean, this is why we travel. I mean, the places are amazing. But it's really for the people because the people make a city. I mean, uh, 
in, in Morocco, which we're going to talk about in a minute, is you know, Marrakesh is this great Medina, but the Medina is alive. It's about the people that make uh, a city or any city a place. And so it's being able to access those people. And, and, and everybody loves food. There's nobody who doesn't like food. And so if you ask somebody about the food, you're guaranteed to get really warm, receptive, and a passionate answer. And, and everybody's an expert in their own food. And this is something that I like writing about food because I also write about, used to write about architecture. But I mean, who knows who built your house and who really cares, you know? But food, I mean, everybody's an expert in their own food. And we're all, you know, from our experiences growing up, and a lot of those are, are younger memories. Mm. And so everybody has that connection. And so when you're in a new place and you're, and you're you know, you ask, so what, what is this? Or what should I order? Or what, what should I buy here? People are extremely helpful. And it's, it's an easy way. To connect it's with an people. easy opening, right. you know. With, without a, it, it, it's an easy way to connect to people, mm -hmm. and, and it's it's fundamental. I mm. mean, no, I find that because I travel uh, very extensively, and food is a common denominator. I mean, you have dinners, lunches with people; they're so willing to share about you know the the home recipes, of restaurants that they like going to, and you know. You yeah, I mean, and 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 everybody, everybody's mother is also the best cook. Good. And when I was working on the, on, the, on the Morocco cookbook, I have a Moroccan friend who helped me a lot traveling around, and he's always talking about his mother's cooking. And so when I was in Rabat once, I said, okay, Shakib, I'm going to go to your mother's house and find out. You know? And so he organized, so I spent, I spent a lot of people's kitchens you know, taking notes and eating. And so it was one of the few cases when actually, you know, he talked endlessly about his famous mother as a cook. And she was a very good cook, and recipe is in the book, actually. Oh, but it was one of those few times when you could actually try to get somebody to, to prove it, no? Mm -hmm. But people invite you to the house a lot. I mean, it, this yeah. is, um, people, because food is also, you can, you can share it. I mean, it's easy to share. Yes. No, and I'm hoping after the session, many of you can share your uh, recommendations for Jeff uh, for what he can taste exactly. in the hall. But, the, you know, in traveling, I saw certain things that I realized that, you know, in, in my house, the table's square. You can fit six or four, and mm -hmm. growing up, you, but many countries like Morocco, it's round. It's the idea that you can always fit one more. Mm. You know, that, that's a way of looking at the table. You can always, you know, can always fit more at a round table than a square mm -hmm. table. I mean, this is, culturally, it's a, one of the things and we can all, mm. and you have to eat, so. Right, no, uh, one, and in Loho, we eat often and well. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your career in food writing. You started, I mean, you were traveling for four years and then you moved on to, uh, you know, how did you end up in Spain? You've been there about Well, that, that, years. that actually went via Lahore. Mm -hmm. um, it was so hot here. Uh, I was spending time in the British Council Library with the air conditioning. And, and I discovered these amazing, um, you know, catalogs about postgraduate programs in the UK and, and, and Ireland and around. And so I started reading these catalogs. And I saw it here, I brought away for some information there's some different schools. And as I was traveling around, it took a couple of years, but you get information back and I ended up applying. And then I ended up in graduate school in London. So after four years, um, thanks to the initial start, and I, I went to, I remember very distinctly, I was at King's College in London, had this beautiful kind of maroon, very thick paper, and, and these, you know, looking at this nice, cool landscape. Um, mm -hmm. So it, the, the path came through here, but in London, I met a woman from Barcelona mm -hmm. um, who we shared uh, a kitchen and a residence hall. And I was studying theater, but she was a, a scientist. And so when she came back to Spain, uh, I just followed her mm -hmm. and stayed. Um, and I was, you know, that was 20 years ago. So it worked out. We're still married, have, you know, a couple of kids. Mm -hmm. um, but th that began there because I started it as a, as a playwright. So my first in graduate school, but my first four years while she was doing a PhD, I was writing plays. Mm -hmm. um, I was spending a lot of time in London because um, I was also at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and going back and forth in the summers. But, you know, as, as I say here, I, I wasn't a very good playwright. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the directors would get these comments, oh, the best part of the play are the stage instructions and, you know, which is not what you want to hear when you think you're this great lyrical, you know, playwright. And they're, they're only going to talk about the stage instructions. And after some years, um, my wife, uh, who's an organic chemist, got a postdoctorate offer in La Jolla in California. And so after four years of the theater, I said, that's it. I mean, I, I, I couldn't make any money doing it, impossible. So I swore off the theater. And um, we moved to California, and I started from scratch. I was 30, um, writing for magazines and newspapers. Okay. And my first article I published was about churros. And my wife was like, who would want to read about, about this Spanish thing? 
And really early on, I found, apart from being a big market, I found that the food was just a way to tell a story. Right. I mean, food is, became, from the beginning of my writing, as a way to tell a story. I mean, I'm not personally that interested in the celebrity chef or that. It's the culture around food or the way to approach a place through the food. And it's, it's that little, that little pinhole, you know, thing you look through, that prism, and you, mm. you kind of enter. So my food writing began you know, in 2000, um, working uh, for different magazines and newspapers. Mm -hmm. And then with that, you know, if you want to really learn how to read a book, try writing a novel. Mm -hmm. And cooking is a little bit the same way. And so um, I learned how to cook in Spain uh, a bit, but I really kind of had to teach myself better. And so I started cooking more, and that led to, the, to recipe work, and that led to my first cookbook. Mm -hmm. And tell me a little bit about your life in Spain, because that sounds delicious. I mean, that you go to the markets, the butchers. Yeah, the, the I mean, and my youngest one is 12, so she started the high school. So until this year, it used to be, you know, I'd walk my kids to school. Um, I go work in a cafe or two. Not because anything romantic, but working in cafes, it's just I can't stand my house for an entire day. So you just, <laughs> you find an empty, an empty bar, the ugliest, emptiest, most plain uh, bar, I work for an hour or two. And then I go to the market on the way home. And so, you know, I... I or there are different markets, and, and my butcher is different, and, and I generally pass every day the market. Mm -hmm. And you were saying the butchers in Barcelona are mainly female. Mine are women, absolutely. Um, uh, the, the, one, the butcher right next to my house is fronted by six women. I think mm -hmm. there's a man in the back, um, or two, hidden, but um, the butchers are women for sure. And this is also where I learned how to cook, uh, if anywhere. Um, one of the main people, the, the women in the butcher, um, saying, wow, I think I feel like making lamb today. You know, what, what do you recommend? And then you have a half an hour of, of, of ideas. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when you go back the next day, it depends how, if it turns out well, you go back the next day. If it doesn't, you kind of leave it a week, and maybe they forget. Because they're always going to ask you, you know, mm -hmm. how was it? And they're going to ask my wife if she goes, or maybe my kids if they happen to pass by, mm -hmm. to find out. Really <laughs> curious. Um, but the, so my life is, is in my office and in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And when I'm working on uh, cookbooks, I'm in the kitchen all afternoon. We're testing three recipes a day, maybe. Mm -hmm. So my, I did four cookbooks in a row. And so my, my kids grew up eating what I was working on. There was oh, no okay. choice of, of food. <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, and the beginning of a cookbook is always really fun because it's all the good stuff. You know, the one book on rice and stuff. The great rice, but by the end, it's like stuffed pigeon and this and, and all of the, you know, the, the, the kidneys. And that you kind of keep delaying that. And so the, the last month of cookbook work is always recipes that maybe aren't ideal. Mm -hmm. So my, my kids never were able to like really say what they wanted for dinner. Mm -hmm. So when, when, I, when I started writing another kind of work, and there were no recipes really in with this one, in the beginning they loved it. Oh, I said, well, what do you want for dinner? Anything. So they loved this. But after about a couple of months, they said, stop asking. I don't care. J just cook. <laughs> And now, and then, you know, another few months later, they're like, can you make something different, you know? Because now it's the same stuff. Over and over. after the second book, my youngest one, for the last six months, she's been saying, you can't, you have to do a cookbook. People are not interested in those boring books. People want to make interesting food. You've got to make a cookbook. She's mm. so tired of my cooking of, mm. the same of the same 20 things or, or 30 things. Because at home, it's only, I, I'm the only cook. My, my wife doesn't cook, so um, they only have me to kind of <laughs> approach and complain about. Which will be a welcome thing to hear for Lahori <laughs> women <laughs> uh, in the kitchen. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on your Morocco book and just to read out actually the head note um, where Jeff describes couscous, which is a very famous you know, dish in Morocco, that this classic couscous exemplifies a sophisticated and harmonious blending of the sweet with the savory. The broth and tender chicken laden with a mixture of fragrant spices are delectable but the real star is a caramelized onion and the raisin tefaya that tops the couscous grains like a regal honeyed crown. The dish is delicious with cold glasses of ibn, which is buttermilk, or lassi, which go. is the local equivalent. So tell, us, tell me a little bit about uh, Morocco. How did you, I mean, you spent a lot of time there. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it, obviously it's close to Spain, so um, I love it. I find really interesting, fascinating country, diverse. The hospitality is unbelievable how people treat you. Um, I learned a lot about food there, and it's. I, I travel quite a bit, a number of times a year. I was just there recently. Um, and the food is phenomenal. I mean, because it, 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 it's one of the great cuisines of the world, and it's one of the great underrated cuisines, because it's an imperial cuisine, like the Alma Empire, um, like 
the, the Chinese, even to an extent, or the French. And the subcontinent is this great legacy of, of, of rulers that had money. And to have, so the cooks could have in the palace all the ingredients. And they could have the best cooks to come. And, you know, in Morocco since the 11th century, they've had a string of dynasties that have an imperial kitchen. There's even a school for, for, for cooks in Rabat uh, in, connected to the, to the royal house for imperial, for, for the... Um, so they actually cooks. people, so you learn the art of royal, like imperial Moroccan it, cuisine? Royal, I mean, Im, imperial cuisine, if anything, is traditional Moroccan food, but a little bit more, maybe slightly more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, but, but even what I learned maybe more than anything in Morocco about food was they say, you know, first we eat with our eyes. And there's this incredible attention placed on detail. I mean, even the most simple couscous, the way they line up every carrot and every little garbanzo bean to the great things. And, and this, I always felt, was because of Islamic art and because of this tradition of interlocking patterns and design work, that there's this great, there's an inherent ability or, or, or love for or, or knowledge in kind of design work. And so when, when, they, when they bring you some sweets, I mean, the, the way that they're stacked just right, mm -hmm. the colors, it's very important, this really elaborate. Um, and this was quite new, obviously, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, one plate with things kind of mashed on it and, mm -hmm. and passed around. This, in beginning with, you know, six different salads, these kind of, I think the best recipe, the best chapter in my book for sure is, is, is the one on salads because they begin with this cold and raw and cooked salad. So you begin six, eight, even 12 different little salads that kind of kick off your meal. And it's just so, I mean, it's... Yeah, no, I mean, I was in Morocco recently and there were two things that struck me. One was just, you know, how long and leisurely the meals are. I mean, it's how meals, you, you expect meals in the Orient to be. These, you know, like several courses and, uh, and then just the sheer, you know, design aesthetic, which is so prevalent in Morocco. So um, there was a very famous designer, French designer, Yves Saint Laurent, who actually spent a lot of time in Morocco and then, um, you know, eventually was buried there. And Jeff and I were talking about that yesterday because Yves Saint Laurent talked about how Morocco taught him about color. And a lot of the color which influenced his designs uh, was learnt in Morocco. So what did you learn from Morocco? Well, th this idea of the thing, but even that color, I mean, some of the spicing of the food, the color is important to the food. It, it, there really is no white food. Mm. It, it has to be colorful, it has to be appealing. And, and this is something to think about because I think when you, it seemed like there's a great respect for the effort that just went into the food or for the food itself or the tradition, but when you're, the way it's laid out, but with, with the, it, it is colorful and, and it is appealing. Again, it's as I said, I mean, first we eat with our eye. I mean, this is, and, and with, with the tea, it's the same. The, the, it, making tea is a whole ritual behind the mint tea. You just don't dunk a little bag in the, in the, in the water. It's, it's just, they call it a tea ceremony. I mean, it's mm. ceremonial and they're pouring it and tasting it. And in mm. the end, they pour from really high and it's right. super important, uh, no, you know, and. And, and I always I ask everybody, so why, I mean, why do that? And the scientists will say, well, it's because when you boil tea, it loses mm -hmm. its life and it's re-aerated. Mm. And you know, people say, no, no, it's because it's saying, you know, pay attention, N now the tea's here. Mm. Other people say, no, it's for that smell. One, one guy told me recently in, in Tangier last time, he said, um, if first we eat with our eyes, first we drink with our nose. And so when they pour the tea like that, it kind of fills the room with the smell of mint. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much mint in the tea, it makes your mouth almost numb. I mean, it's not, it's not two mint leaves. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, half, it's a handful. handful of mint. And so when they pour it, the room takes on this beautiful Aroma. smell. Mm -hmm. um, they love the orange blossom water and these. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's all, it's really multi-sensual mm -hmm. in, in a sense. But tell me, now that you've, uh, you know, I mean, you've mentioned tea, one of the, the, late, one of the latest books has been Darjeeling, and I would uh, encourage, uh, any of you to pick that up. It's available outside and it's a fascinating history about uh, Darjeeling tea uh, and just the history. So how did you get, in, you know, how did you move from, you know, Morocco and Spain to yeah, it, India? It's, it's really not so easy to move. I mean, it seems similar, but to move from cookbooks to a classic narrative nonfiction, mm -hmm. first you have to convince your agent and then you got to find a, a, a publisher. It's not so easy really because it's a little bit of a jump. But I really wanted something different. I mean, I did four cookbooks in seven years. Um, my Spain book was kind of the end, and I, I needed a, a break. And this is a story, having been in Darjeeling, that I loved, and I wanted to kind of tell. And so, um, you know, I spent you know a couple of years working on that book, a number of months on the hills, in the hills, on the tea estates. 
So tell me a little bit about the structure of the book because it's done the, almost like the flush. Yeah, you know? so in, in Darjeeling, Dar Darjeeling is, uh, is the world's uh, most expensive black tea. Um, but there's only 8 million kilos that are being produced in India, and India makes a billion kilos, so it's a very small amount of tea. Um, but this tea is all kind of hand-plucked, and it's, it's very, very particular. But they pluck the bushes from uh, February, March until November, and there's four flushes, as they call it. So when you talk about Darjeeling tea, you talk about a flush. Now, originally, I wanted to call the book, the subtitle, you know, A History of the World's Greatest Tea in Four Flushes. And of course, of course, the marketing department completely mixed that idea. They're like, you cannot have the word flush on, the bo on a book that's not about toilets. I mean, nobody's going to want to buy a food book with flush on it. But flush is a unique concept in Darjeeling because the teas change over the course of those months. I mean, so the first teas in the spring, they're light and bright and a little bit of a briskness to them, and they're real bright, yellowish green. And as the weather changes, the leaves change. And so they pluck the tea bush every week. And throughout those course of those months, the, the, the bushes change, the leaves change for the monsoon and then after in the fall, and then the tea changes also. Mm -hmm. So where you start with, there's a photo in the book that shows this, uh, that it starts in this lightish color and it ends almost a maroon, purplish color. Mm -hmm. On the same farm, on the same way of plucking it, just the change in the, in the land and in, 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 in the bush. So the book is divided into four flushes. In the end, I, I couldn't use it on the cover, but it's obviously a really big point. Um, so I, I divide it that way, but there's a lot, you know, tea's not from Darjeeling. No. You know, and, and the English, you know, the East India Company, I should say, developed in a, you know, they were, it was bankrupting the country how much tea they were importing from China. Mm -hmm. Because the Chinese, they, they only wanted silver. They didn't want to trade. They, they didn't want Wedgwood mm -hmm. or clocks. I mean, they wanted silver. And so the English needed to find something. Um, to trade. In the end, they found opium. But... Um, <laughs> The, in the meantime, though, in the 19th century, they were able to establish industry in Assam. Mm -hmm. And Assam tea, there's some really good Assam tea, but in general, it's a, it's a little bit lower quality. And they missed that fine quality of some of the Chinese teas that they were getting. And so they sent, in, the, in around 1840, a Scottish guy to China to smuggle out some of the fine, mm -hmm. um, some of the, the best teas. And also, they didn't know how to make it, so they had to convince some Chinese tea workers to actually illegally come to India to, to teach people. Mm -hmm. And that's how uh, it, it started. Um, they brought it to Calcutta and it went to some hill stations uh, to kind of try it out. And Darjeeling was established. It was already a, you know, a place to rest and recuperate. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the head of Darjeeling at that time uh, planted some in his garden. And it did really well and it kind of took off from there. Mm. So it's kind of accidental. So the story of how it got to, uh, you know, that's one of the first two flushes, I guess. How mm -hmm. it got to India um, is a real kind of blockbuster story about, mm -hmm. you know, it's really you know, it's an adventure story. Mm -hmm. And no, and it's very interesting. I mean, even for people in Pakistan, because tea, I mean, tea is part very much inherent in our culture. I mean, we're not a nation of coffee drinkers. It's very much yeah. tea, and it dates back to colonial, uh, colonial times. Uh, so how was it being on a tree? Tea uh, plantation. Oh, I mean, amazing. What is, what amazing. is life like it, it, on a tea plantation? Yeah, I mean, I spent a couple of months on tea plantation, and there's nothing for me. And, and in, where they, they call it a factory, but where they actually make the tea when they, after they pluck it, it's like being in a bakery. It's like this, you know, a bakery is like the heightened smell of bread. Um, the freshly roasted tea is just this incredible warm. Sometimes you take tea leaves and you kind of blow on them, which is what they do there. You kind of warm and you kind of smell it. It's a certain aroma. Um, it's like that magnified, and they do these morning tastings, and it's, it, it's, it's pretty incredible. And of course, the landscape, that beautiful, mm -hmm. tamed. Um, my, my new book's coming out is on, on coffee, and mostly on Ethiopia, of wild coffee. And this was the, like the opposite change, because instead of being in this beautiful, tamed landscape in the Himalaya, mm -hmm. you know, it was in a wild forest um, in, in the southwest, in the, in the, in the, in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a very big jump as yeah. far as the research on the ground research went, to yeah. go from a, a, a Darjeeling tea estate to you know, a cloud forest in deep southwest Ethiopia, right. um, you know, fording rivers to get to where you wanted to go. And, um, so I, my, my time, I, I don't think I could ever do a book probably as enjoyable as, as Darjeeling. It was perfect for, for me to, to work on.
Okay, so I'm just mindful we have about seven minutes. So, uh, you know, as I wrap up, there are two other questions I had. One was, you know, what advice, you, there, obviously a lot of people uh, here interested in food. I'm seeing a friend of mine walk up who is doing food blogging and, you know, uh, TV show, trying to put together a TV show on food. So what advice would you give to aspiring people in, you know, who want to consider this uh, I mean, professionally? I, in my case, I mean, I, I'm not a natural writer. I mean, I, I never was. And I was not even a foodie, I mean, for sure. Um, I came upon it in my own way. I came upon it late. And, but I've been able to use the elements that I picked up on that journey now. And, and I think you just have to really kind of use what you have. I mean, it, it, anytime you sell an article, you have to answer two questions. Why now and why me? And, and to be true to that me, that uniqueness, what makes you unique, I think is the most important thing because, you know, I'm not a New York food critic. And, but people are, but I have to use what I, you know, for my travel or my time in Spain, I have to use what, what makes me and my piece be unique. And I think that there's such a great interest in authenticity, you know, people from here, people want, I want to read somebody who lives here writing about their food, yes. not somebody who comes in for three days and writes right. about their food. Okay, my cookbooks are a bit different because I'm also trying to translate a place to a certain audience. I'm trying to bring them. These are not my recipes. I'm recipes from people's homes that I'm helping a Western cook make in their kitchen. Um, but when I read about food, though, I mean, I know, you know, there's all these Mediterranean experts in Napa. So how can you be an expert in, in the Mediterranean? Yes, living in Napa. Napa. But these are, that's a different generation. Now it's about, no, you have food bloggers, you got people, you have access. I want to read what you're writing about the food, you know, in your own city. This is what's interesting. And now we can do that. Where, I mean, 10 years ago, it would be difficult. So finally, my last question to you would be really, amongst all the food that you've ever tasted, if you really had to have, um, I mean, if you had to choose the last supper, uh, what would that be? <laughs> I mean, it, there's really kind of two elements uh, I think of my life that, that, that I look upon most fondly. And one is my time traveling. And tea probably represents, if anything, that time. And particularly like a good spicy, like good masala chai. I really, I, I love Darjeeling, and don't get me wrong, but I mean, a good masala chai reminds me of, of the energy and the hecticness of the road, mm. of, of being in the subcontinent, you know, being in the middle of it. The Darjeeling reminds me of a different, you know, yeah. phase of my life. But the second, I would have some sort of rice dish because for me now, you know, with two kids and um, living in Spain a long time, rice for me is a family meal. And mm -hmm. it's, it's when, you know, it's what I make the most when people come over. But most likely, if you come to my house for dinner, you probably get some sort of rice dish because mm -hmm. for me, it's the easiest um, to, to make, having done some books about rice. Mm -hmm. um, so this, but this is where, you know, my mother-in-law makes rice paella every single weekend and she has for 50 years. This is the family. Mm -hmm dish. So this is what I associate of my two decades in Spain, that sense of kind of coming around a pan together and, mm -hmm. and eating. No, and it's great you say rice because in the last panel where Teju, Cole and uh, Mohsin were talking, they were talking about the ultimate biryani, uh, yeah. which we also pride ourselves on. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you, you can argue with the Spaniard about the rice, but you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so I just like to open it up to any questions. Uh, I think there's a roving mic. Um, there's one here, this lady. Hi, my name is Aisha, and um, I'm so glad to hear all this, you know, what you had to say. Um, my question is that, you know, I, uh, I suppose you've been all, um, all over the place, you've been around so many countries, and I haven't had a chance to look at your books or read them, but um, it's the first time I'm listening to all the talk that you had to give. Um, my question being, more of an opinion, but I'd like your take on it. Um, how has um, food um, affected you as a person? And um, um, do you think it has, uh, it has uh, I mean, other than being indigenous to the people that, um, uh, you know, um, it is used by, do you think it, it has changed you over the years? I mean, how you started off... Uh, as mm. and what you find yourself uh, well, the, today? I mean, the, the, certainly, well, one thing, I mean, everything we take, we eat becomes part of us, you know? I mean, this is something I began to realize. Um, it, you know, the, the tea, it, we're, we're, we're eating it, you know? So I think, I, I think a little bit maybe more now about the food, but it was really moving to Spain and discovering seasonality. Where I grew up, you know, artichokes for 12 months a year. I had no idea. I used to work in a grocery store. 
and even a butcher. I had no idea. I couldn't have told you when artichokes were in season. Traveling and in, and, in, and, in, and in Spain, I realized the seasonality of things. I mean, when things are at their best, they're, they're the cheapest, and the pile is the biggest in the market. You know, they, it, it grows. It's not expensive and small, and it grows and gets cheaper and better, and then it kind of goes down. Um, so, I, I cha food changed me, I think, in, in, I definitely more seasonally, you know, I don't, I'm not looking for quince now. I mean, it, it's, I try to, it's almost feast and famine, and this is what bothers my kids sometimes, because like, we're having this again, it's like, yeah, but this is the season, I mean, you know, but we had sardines already <laughs> in the past, you know, five times, but, this, you know, so th this has, I think, changed me to appreciate also, and also the labor that goes involved into food, it seems so underpriced and so undervalued, I mean, the, the expense of the earth for the food to start with and what goes into the food, but even the, the worker, I mean, the, I don't think we pay enough for food. Okay? I don't want to pay more, I'm not saying that, but it, I think the food is undervalued in the market, you know, and it seems that the effort really that goes into producing good food mm -hmm. um, is, is, is enormous, and that is not valued yet, I don't think, or is coming. Because in Spain, it's not much of an organic thing because an organic chicken cost me 35 euros a normal one cost me three i mean it's this there's not a midpoint yet other countries yes um but just the regular vegetables i mean just to try to appreciate so to go to the more farmers markets i mean we have good markets but on the outskirts in the summers you know to try to buy directly from the farmer you know to try to i don't know i just having spent a lot of time on you know olive oil places and farms and stuff i realize the work that goes into a bottle of olive oil, and it's, it's a lot, and it should be a lot more than what you're paying for. Mm -hmm. so. okay. yeah. Any other questions? Uh, any, Amina? Go ahead. What you felt was the most luxurious and the most um, decadent meal you had there, and how that reflects the particular, um, you know, the, the people of that time, that area, I know that, you know, in Fez, they, they're very into that decadent cuisine, but in the desert, it's a lot more simple and it reflects a way of life. So how do you feel that food reflects a way of life in the places you've traveled and particularly in Morocco? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the question, I think, was about how food reflects kind of the, the lifestyle. I mean, it seemed like the countries that spend the most time eating <laughs> are, are the kind of most, you know, relaxing and the most personal. I mean, the countries that spend little time and effort on, on food, I think you can kind of keep going. I mean, it, it's for sure the place I like the most. I mean, appreciate because it, it, usually the food, I mean, if, if you take, if you really, I think, value the food and, and the time, you know, we have an old aunt in, in the middle of Spain, and she always says, Fai is only the excuse to get people together. You know, it's not really about the rice. It's about us coming together and having those, those hours. And the countries that I, I see that really, value the food and the time and, and this obsessiveness are the places that I like the most. Not only for the food, but because it's, it's the thing that most relaxing and the most interactive and you have these tight family networks as opposed to, you know, maybe what I grew up with, but <laughs> the places that seem to spend less effort or time with the food. I don't know, it's, it's a different connection. It's, you know, in, in Ethiopia they say, you know, coffee drinking is, 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 a, is a group activity. You never drink coffee alone. It's impossible you have a coffee alone. You know, they, they don't understand you get a coffee to go and sit and drink it alone because it's, it's about, it's something else. You know, the, the food is just, just there. Those are the places that I like because it's, there's such, so much human interaction that the food gives you an excuse to. I mean, um, to have a coffee in Ethiopia is the same as to have a meet and have to talk. It's the same, it's the same verb. Because it, they go together. You can't not have coffee and not talk. And th this is, I, mean, I think this is a... Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, food is a very social activity in, in any culture. I mean, it brings people together. So I think we have t uh, time for one last question. If there are any, uh, please go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, what's your take on fast food? <laughs> and don't you think it's the truly global, uh, national food of the global world nowadays? I like guess yeah. it's, it's I mean, can the, be called. I think you can have the fast good food, and and I mean all fast food is good, isn't it? No, no, but I mean you mean fast food like the the, the chain? No, I mean for me they're horrible. I mean I would say I'm not interested. Um, but I can cook very fast and and quite good. I mean I, I think even this now where people say oh but it's just fast food to go to this place and eat. No, not really. You know I mean you, you, I think you can eat quite fast and good. But there's this, I think there's going to be a, more of a movement toward what they call in fast good food that. that it's a little bit quicker preparation, but they're still actually trying to make it. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, with the ingredients that some of these fast food chains use, obviously, are 
terrible, but as a person traveling, I mean, this, I'm not interested in that because it, it's what's interested is the, is the local thing, though, and it just, I don't go to Starbucks when I travel. I'm not interested in that. Not because I, I don't like the coffee, but because it's too bitter, but I'm not interested in kind of the blandness of the globalness because I, you, you, you hate to see the loss of the local tradition, local cultures, because that's also why we travel, no? I mean, uh, move around. I mean, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but um, yeah, it's, it's a problem everywhere. I mean, it, 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 it's a sad sense of people sometimes feel that's the, the most modern thing, that they, you know, the young people want to go to because it's like the, the modern way of eating. I mean, it's, you know, you say, oh, I'd rather eat in your mother's house, I think, but, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, it, yeah, there was never any fast food at mother's house, so, you know, I mean, traditional. Yeah, slow, I, exactly, I mean, the, the thing cooking. is, my Spain book is basically about the country cooking <laughs> in Spain, and the most green, head-to-tail cooking or wh whatever today is the most old-fashioned, you know, grandma's or mom's cooking is the most modern, now, in San Francisco, these kind of head-to-tail restaurants, and this, oh. I mean, no, I mean, you buy a chicken, you have three meals, you don't buy chicken breast. Mm -hmm. And so th there is a movement back to it. To traditional. To, to, uh, you know, I mean, to these other parts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that, I think we've run out of time. But I just wanted you to applaud Jeff for his contribution for coming oh, to Pakistan. I'm so happy to be back. So. And I hope that you can pick up a copy of Darjeeling. It's a fascinating read. And of course, this beautifully done book on Morocco, which I think, uh, I'm not sure whether mm, it's available so. here, but... Uh, uh, well, We'll be in the back. If anybody has any yes, questions, exactly. whatever, I'm happy to answer any questions. And please so, feel free food. to share your food recommendations yeah, with yeah, Jeff yeah. about. Lunch. I have my notebook, so I'll take some notes. <laughs> Thank okay, you so thanks. much, Jeff.